I was not a biker and I did not bike at all. And the cargo bike is actually the very first bike I have ever owned. It really became inspired when we spent the summer in the Netherlands. The Netherlands was you know, one of these, you know, biking utopias for us. And so we were going there kind of frequently. And then we finally did this exchange. And in true Dutch fashion, we walked into their garage and they had like a million bikes. Yeah. Including, you know, the classic wooden box feet. And so we started taking it out and we just started moving our kids around by bike. And it was eye opening at how efficient and how fun and how, you know, liberating being on bike could be. This is such an incredible way of getting around New York City and experiencing New York City that I just wanted to start getting that message out there. And so that's when I started the Instagram account to really promote what it's like biking in the city. And it's not nearly as scary and anyone can, well, most people can do it. And, you know, I just felt like I just wanted to, you know, try and be that inspiration. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. My name is John Simmerman and that is Maddie Novich, uh, also known as Cargo Bike Mama out on Instagram. And you can also sign up for her newsletter at CargoBikeMama.com. And we are going to be learning about her journey to becoming a cargo bike influencer. I can't wait. Let's get right to it. <laughs> Here is Maddie. Well, Maddie Novich, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Maddie, I love having my guests just say a few words about themselves. So who the heck is Maddie? Well, I am a full-time working mom of three little kids uh, based in New York City. Uh, as a professional, I am a criminal justice um, professor here at a local liberal arts college. And when I am not being a professor and catering to my kids, I am also an Instagram influencer uh, promoting the cargo bike life as a car free, car light alternative. Fantastic. That's fun. It's such a great story that you have. And I learned about you from your conversation with Tiffany over here at the Bottom Up Revolution, which is one of the Strong Towns podcasts. Uh, how fun was that? Uh, was that one of your first few podcast episodes, of, you know, really talking about your your journey? It was among the top first five. So I think I've done a few, I've done about five, six podcasts at this point. And Tiffany's Bottom Up Revolution podcast was maybe number four, I think. Fantastic. And it was great. It was great to connect with her. You know, she's also a mom. She's a biking mom. And so we had a lot to talk about in terms of how to create uh, biking as a, you know, lifestyle as a parent. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. And of course, she's just up the road from me uh, up in the Waco, Texas area. And so uh, another uh, Texas connection there. Yes, for <laughs> sure. So talk a little bit about that story. How did you go from the job that you're doing, the serious work that you're doing to becoming a, an influencer in this arena? It was, I mean, I am a purely accidental influencer, right? It was not my uh, intention to become an influencer. I really wasn't even on Instagram before starting my cargo bike account. And so it was just one of those things where I decided to get a cargo bike and I live in New York City. So I have this amazing backdrop to really showcase biking as a lifestyle. And my husband was like, you know, you go everywhere on this bike. You need to start documenting where you're going and, you know, start an Instagram account, just take pictures. And, you know, after hemming and hawing for a while, I did. And then it became a really fun, creative outlet for me. So, you know, my work as a professor is, you know, it's very serious. It's very intense. Um, it's wonderful and rewarding, but it is less creative um, in terms of creating you know, art or visuals or movies or any of those things. I'm very much research oriented and teaching oriented. Um, and so I don't get to spend as much doing creative things as, as a professor. And so when I started doing the Instagram account, I just realized how much I loved being a content creator and then being able to use that content creation to push an agenda, my own agenda, to get us all, you know, out of the mindset that we need to have cars when we have families, that we need to move into the suburbs when we have families. And there is just so much 
there are so many alternatives if you can just live a little bit more creatively. And so I started the Instagram account to really showcase that. And now it's, you know, it's really grown all organically and it's very niche and it's very active and fun. And, you know, it's, it's this great outlet that I enjoy. I love it. It's to me, this is just such a, a, a fun, fun story. I want to zoom in on your, your account here and, and just get it as large as I can on screen so that folks can see it. There you are. That is your handle. You are cargo bike mama on Instagram, Matty Novich. <laughs> I love it. So uh, t- take us back though. What uh, you, you kind of shared a little bit there about your husband encouraging you to, you know, to kind of tell your story and, and, and you get, you know, push, pushing stuff out there, but take us, rewind us back. What even got you interested in bikes and cargo bikes as a parent in New York? That is a great question. I, my interest, so I should premise this by saying that I was not a biker and I did not bike at all. And the cargo bike is actually the very first bike I have ever owned. And so it was like, you know, I was, I was what like marketing people would call a cold lead, right? Like, nowhere would I have guessed that I would be this cargo biking person. And it really became inspired when we spent the summer in the Netherlands. And we, you know, we do these amazing home exchanges where we swap our New York City apartments for these homes all over the world. And the Netherlands was you know, one of these, you know, biking utopias for us. And so we were going there kind of frequently. And then we finally did this exchange. And in true Dutch fashion, we walked into their garage and they have like a million bikes. Yeah. Including, you know, the classic wooden box feet. And so we started taking it out and we just started moving our kids around by bike. And it was eye opening at how efficient and how fun and how, you know, liberating being on bike could be. And so we spent the summer in the Netherlands and we come back to New York and like day one, I have to go into the subway and I have to wait for the train for like 20 minutes. And then you're jammed in there and, you know, it's fine. Our New York subway system is amazing and comprehensive. But after coming back from biking where everything was my own time and my own experience, I walked out of the subway station and I said, Jeff, I need one of these bikes. We, we have to have one of these bikes. Like, I don't really care that I've never really biked in New York City. I just, I have to go back to that lifestyle. And he turns to me and he goes, well, that was the most expensive vacation we've ever taken. So we turn around and we order this like $9,000 bicycle. And I get it, you know, a month and a half later. And it literally from day one, it changed my life. And um, that's kind of like how I started. And I felt like, you know, if I could do biking, you know, I'm five feet, I'm like 112 pounds on a good day. If I could bike this like massive hundred pound bicycle with my two, you know, then two kids with no experience, then anybody could do it. So then I was on a mission. You were on a mission. That mission was to go and spread the word, right? To start proselytizing the cargo bike life and being like, this is literally an amazing way of living. And we were car owners, right? We had a car before, uh, while I was finishing my PhD, because I needed it to get to campus. And so the moment I was no longer on campus, we got rid of the car and was doing the subway and the train and the public transit. And it was great. And then we started doing the bike thing. And so I just was like, this is such an incredible way of getting around New York City and experiencing New York City that I just wanted to start getting that message out there. And so that's when I started the Instagram account to really promote what it's like biking in the city. And it's not nearly as scary and anyone can, well, most people can do it. And, you know, I just felt like I just wanted to, you know, try and be that inspiration. Yeah. What year was that first trip? We started going to the Netherlands in 2017, and by 2018, we went back, and by 2019, I was like, I have to have a bike. Okay, so it's 20, 2019, so yeah, so you've, you're, you're going into like year five of, of this, this new lifestyle of, of being Cargo Bike Mama. Of being cargo bike mama, and I became this like niche influencer. There's really very few other lifestyle cargo bike accounts. And so what's been really interesting is that it's really resonated for getting outside. We were talking a little early, right, about how do we break the barriers of these other 
audiences who aren't just biking people. And so I really was like, I am not a biking person, or at least I wasn't a biking person. And so I felt like I might be able to communicate and resonate with people who also didn't necessarily identify as a bike person, but as a mom or as a parent, as someone who just really values their time and needs, you know, all the tricks and trades of the world to try and get their time maximized and get from point A to point B. And so I started angling the account, as you'll notice, it's lifestyle, right? It's about spending days with my kids. It's mostly bike, but it's also fashion and cooking and health living. And and it's just like how we can, you know, sort of break through that you you know, what being a cyclist actually means. And it can mean a number of different things, including being a full-time working mom who has never been in Lycra, right? Has never really rode a bike before, right? So I'd identify as a cyclist and I was the last person who I thought would identify as a cyclist. Yeah. So you you had mentioned the Netherlands was really where that, uh, that inspiration was born out of and through that empowerment of being able to take advantage of the bikes that were there at the house that we were staying in. And obviously a safe network, an all ages and abilities network right outside the door. What city were were you in at that point? We were in Amsterdam. So we were in Amsterdam. In Amsterdam, in Leiden, we've, I mean, now we've traveled over the entire country, um, but we're generally based out of Amsterdam when okay. we go. Fantastic. Very good. And you, you'll appreciate this too, because you've been in other cities. You mentioned Leiden there, um, is that Amsterdam, depending on where you're at, can be pretty intense. It's, there's a lot of activity, very similar to, to, to New York. So for some people, it, it, it could even be a little bit intimidating to ride a bike in that environment because the, of the stream of, of, of cyclists people riding bikes, not really cyclists, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, and, and that's, I think that's a good, good thing for us to pause and, and point out is you, you went out of your way to say that I wasn't a cyclist. I'm not a cyclist. And the reason why that's important is because the, that terminology comes up with an image in North American minds as to what a cyclist is. It tends to be, you mentioned Lycra, it tends to be somebody who's, you know, decked out in special clothing, wearing helmets, doing, you know, all of these things that are, you know, oh, that's my image. That's our image as a society is what a cyclist is versus just a person who is using a tool, a bike or a cargo bike to do things, to get things done, to get from point A to point B. Exactly. And I think, you know, an interesting way of thinking about it is, you know, people who are just using a car every day, do they really identify themselves as like a driver, right? It's just part of, you know, this is how I get around the city and I don't have to sort of I don't have to box myself into a particular label. And so I think that's really important when we are trying to sort of break down the the narrative of what it means to be a cyclist and say that it is actually, you know, can be more encompassing than just sport biking, right? It can be commuting, it can be urban living, and it can be, you know, parent runs, right? Like that's that's basically 90% of my cargo bikes as I'm taking my kids from like point A to point B or going to the grocery, right? (laughs) Which is like the normal parent life. And so I think it's just a really important way to say that, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to just be one way. You can be a a lot of different ways in terms of a biker. Yeah, yeah. A a great example of that is, you know, and this is sort of the Danish approach and also the Dutch approach too, is that, yeah, this is just a pragmatic tool and they tend to be very pragmatic people. And so it just makes sense to do this, to, to ride a bike. Um, Chris Bruntlett with the Dutch Cycling Embassy refers to it as pedestrian plus. It's just, you know, it's a little bit faster than than walking. Uh, and, you know, it, and it, they're no more likely to, uh, you know, call themselves cyclists than they are to uh, call themselves vacuumists if they use a vacuum. So <laughs> exactly. do that, yeah. Exactly. And I think, I think that's a point. And actually, you know, you mentioned something that I think is something at the forefront of a lot of American minds is right. You know, the diff- it was easy to bike in the Netherlands because they have the infrastructure there. Right. And so and you were saying it can be a little intense in Amsterdam. But what is interesting is actually my nine year old was biking in Amsterdam. And it's like it can be very intense until you actually go and sort of participate in it. And once you participate in it, just like in when you're biking here in New York City or in many other places, that you, once you've had that experience of 
biking and seeing what it's like, the actual experience becomes less scary and more manageable and you become more confident. But, you know, going back to the idea that infrastructure, which of course infrastructure is really important, New York City's infrastructure is growing and changing. And so we actually have a lot of great infrastructure. We also have, which is very surprising to a lot of people who don't live here, many of our streets are very quiet, right? So like our cross paths, you know, east, west are actually fairly quiet and, you know, very safe to just take over the entire lane and get from point A to point B. And so I think that can be, you know, a very surprising factor for many people who don't realize that, you know, biking in New York City is actually not only fun, but it's actually very safe. And, you know, no, I'm not, you know, mixing with traffic in Times Square all the time, right? We're, we're getting down, you know, the West Side Highway, which is this amazing protected bike lane or going through Central Park, which is, you know, car free. So, and the, the uh, West Side, uh, Central Park West bike lane, which is new. So there's a, actually a lot of biking now that I think is, you know, can be very surprising. And so it gives me hope that if New York can do it, then hopefully other parts of America can do it and we can continue to grow and advocate for safer biking paths. Yeah. And I'm glad you mentioned that too, because this particular image that we're looking at has you posing uh, with a Reese and Mueller uh, cargo bike, uh, you know, on a quieter street, Exactly. Posed up in the middle of the street. And it brings up the point about the Dutch cycling network is that about 60 to 70 percent of a typical Dutch cycling network in most of the cities is actually some form of shared space, just like what we're looking at right here. Uh, the Feetstraats and other uh, the ETWs, which are the, um, the the local access streets, tend to be paved in brick and have no bicycling infrastructure per se, but they're slow speed, low volume zones where people are sharing space. And that becomes a just the way that you get around your, your community. And then on the busier streets, then they do have protected and separated infrastructure and the uh, feats, the feats pods, the, the cycle paths and, and, uh, and bike lanes and protected bike lanes, which are so famous. And, and most people think of that as the Dutch cycling network. But in reality, um, the vast majority of the network is some form of shared space, just like what we're looking at here. Absolutely. And we actually, when we were in the Netherlands, we, we went through a bunch of those different shared spaces and separated spaces. I think the main difference that they have there and we have here is there is cultural acceptance of these slow zone spaces. We aren't there yet, right? So we have a very insular car culture where car drivers feel that they have the right of way and that they are allowed to be as fast or as aggressive as they want to be. And they aren't thinking necessarily about the shared space. And I'm hoping that, you know, with more cyclists and more visual presence of people on bikes in these shared spaces that we can begin to shift that cultural narrative because it's, you know, we need it, I think. Yeah. Well, and I think that as we start to see more and more images of, you know, of families being out, be able to get there, and I'm going to bring your, your, your family shot back up on screen here. I mean, this, this is part of how we change that cultural narrative of, you know, who the streets are for, you know. I've got my mug that says streets are for people because it's true. Streets really are for people. They were for people, you know, for thousands of years until the interloper, the automobile came along. And so I think that reinforcing the work that you're doing as an influencer and trying to help change, in, enhance awareness and maybe change minds as to what our streets are for. These are the types of things that really help move that, you know, when we talk about cultural shifts, this is how we do it. And that's my background as, as a health promotion professional and looking at behavior change. And that's how we create what I call culture of activity is by normalizing what we see on screen. Exactly. And what's actually very interesting is about this picture, which I want to point out, is this street that's behind me that you kind of see all the cars facing forward. That's actually one of the very few closed streets in, ha in Harlem, or we should say open streets, where there is a barrier. And unless you live there, you're not really allowed to drive down this street, which is why we are there taking pictures. And this street is really special in New York City because it turns into it's the source of all of our or many holiday um, uh 
activities and outdoor, you know, um, street fairs, things like that, because this particular street is very special in Harlem. But, you know, and then me being out there, I try to be out there on my bike, sort of showing people because in New York, it's a very unusual thing still. And people are always stopping and asking questions. And I'm going to share some video um, with you about people's reactions when they see us on these bikes. And it's really interesting. Um, and actually, there's a um, one of my le uh, latest posts that I did, one of these real feeds, just showed New Yorkers responses. And it's always smiles and, you know, thumbs up or asking questions. And we want to be ha having those questions asked so that we can give the answers of how amazing these bikes are, these are and how they can truly transform people's lives and make it a really amazing way. But also, of course, all of the residual benefits of exercise, mental health, cost savings, and, um, you know, better, it's obviously better for our environment than the car. And, you, you know, it's, it's a, one of these things that I love being out in the streets with these bikes, because especially in New York and most and many other places around America, they're conversation starters. And that's, as you said, that's, I think, how we change this this narrative is the more conversation starters we can get on the streets, I think the better we are going to have, you know, in terms of the number of conversations that we have. And that's, I think, really important. What, what I love about you as a as an influencer and a content creator is that you are influencing people and engaging with people not only online but out also out on the streets and that's a core part of of the content that you're creating is that it's also in IRL in real life out there uh, so I, I well let's get over to that recent post that you did that we you said that you had some and I've turned the volume up on the video so we can uh, activate that uh, and before we do that I just want to I'm like oh a bunch bike another uh, a Texas company there that's you go. exactly right yeah that was Denton bike Texas four in my collection Wow so I'm bike. Very, very cool. Uh, yeah, it's really fun. Yeah, it's a, it's been really fun. I think, you know, part of this is actually I work with a lot of different brands because it's not just about, you know, me showcasing sort of cargo bikes as a lifestyle, but also helping people who are cargo bike curious find the right bike for themselves. So I don't ever work exclusively with one brand because that, I think, defeats what it is, you know, to be a cargo bike influencer. So this is just a day in the life. But if you scroll down a little bit, I'm going to show you, you will see there's a, a post. Um, I think this is actually, actually, we could go through some of these, which I think is interesting, where the other one was me being a professional and what it looks like to be a cyclist. So um, this one, I started to just remind people that it's not, you know, this is biking in the Netherlands. This is Het Twiske, which is just a beautiful park right outside of Amsterdam, but also New York City can be really beautiful and it's not all bad. So I want to make sure that we're controlling the narrative in terms of, you know, sure, there's a lot of elements of biking in New York City that are you know, horrible and annoying, but there's also a lot of parts where it's really fun to bike in New York City. And so keep going and I'm going to go, it's, it's coming up. Um, that's one more, one more, I think it's right before this one. Oh, no, this one's security. Um, this, uh, this, uh, this actually highlights some of the challenges we face, which is we don't have great separated infrastructure. And so I am constantly showcasing you know, more as a message for generating awareness that we need separated and protected bike lanes, because if we don't protect them, this is what happens. And this is this neighborhood. It always looks like this. And I like that, too, because you're, you're not just glossing over things and only showing the good stuff. Right. You know, you're you are being real about the fact that. Um, yeah, we, we do have streets that need to be taken care of, and it's not all the, the quiet street that, you know, that we posed in front of. There's challenges out there, and so there's still a lot of work yet to be done. So Absolutely. Yeah, that's good. And what's interesting is those are posts of mine are the ones that do, the, that do really, really well. I wouldn't say the best, but they do really well because they really touch a nerve. And I think that, you know, not having, um, you know, just using the voice to – to showcase that like, we need these changes too. So this actually right before this one, if you go down one more, is the is the reel that I wanted to show you about what it's like with New Yorkers. Um, uh, oh no, sorry, one more, one more. <laughs> um, yep, yep, here we go. This is how New York, this is what happens every time we go out. Yeah, talk a little bit about this experience. You just mentioned that this one received a lot of views. And this is really what it's all about, the engagement that's happening out on the street. 
Absolutely. So this, I put this together after we spent uh, Earth Day biking around Upper Manhattan, and we didn't know any of these people, right? So these are all strangers, but there's something about these bikes and the way that we carry our kids that is inherently interesting and thought provoking and people become really friendly. So like, you know, this guy just came over and he just wanted to say hi to our kids and like, you know, high five us for having our kids out in bikes, right? And, you know, you can just see, sort of see the curiosity heads turn all the time right and I you know I wish I had more uh, cameras just set up all the time because people are like that's so cool wow where'd you get that you know can I go for a ride you know all these kinds of things and this is just a this is just a normal experience of what I what I have in New York City and so um, you know the, the people always come up and stop and inspect they ask questions and then it's also very common for people to be like hey can I have a ride I mean they're not serious but of course they could have a ride because that's the yeah. point of the <laughs> But that's a very normal, normalized experience for us. And I just love, you know, especially with the bunch, um, that bike gets a lot of attention because it is so cute and charming. And, you know, people are like, where's the ice cream, right? They think of it as like, you know, it's just a very, there's a lot of fun about, you know, these kinds of bikes. Um, and so I just, I love having these interactions and engagements with, the people around me. And that I think is the one thing that's really special about a bike in these cities is that you and your passengers, my children are so engaged with the environment around them. They're talking about what they're seeing. They're saying hi to people. They're, you know, pointing out observations that you wouldn't necessarily have on the subway or in a car. And I think that's, you know, a really important component about biking that is distinctly unique. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I notice you do have, uh, you know, quite a few uh, posts on here where you are, uh, you know, going over fashion stuff. And I think it's important to, to point out is that, yeah, I mean, you're dressing for your destination. You're not dressing for, quote unquote, riding a bike. Exactly. And I think that that is a point of friction for a lot of people. The idea that they don't think that they can be dressed for the day and go out and use the bike as their means of transport. And so, you know, I really love fashion. It's a passion of mine. It always has been. And I wanted to spend time focusing on the fact that you can be really stylish and you can wear what you like and still use a bike no matter the weather, right? So I'll also bike look like that and then bike in inclement weather as well. So, you know, it's just about having the right gear. It's about showcasing again, that if I can do it, I think that most people can do it. And so, you know, I've been, I've been really enjoying that component of it is this like lifestyle. Yeah. And again, we're back to the, this, you know, sort of, uh, less than positive experience. And, uh, really the message here is, you know, l honing in on what we mean when we talk about an all ages and abilities bike lane, um, and, and really making the point that if it's just a piece of paint or if it's just a strip of paint, it's not going to be, you know, respected by the drivers necessarily. And so that brings us back to uh, the discussion we were having of the difference between shared space and, you know, actual bike lanes where you have physical separation and protection, uh, where you're away from motor vehicles, you know, both parked as, as well as, as, as driving. Uh, and so I, I appreciate that you put this together. Um, Talk a little bit about some of the negative reactions that you do get, because I know that it's impossible not to get some negative uh, reactions from the motoring public. Um, as Ian Walker says, he calls it motor normativity or car brain that people have. Uh, it, so we can't just be all positive, 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 just like with this, this bike lane here. Um, do, do you get people who are responding and saying, you know, getting on your case and saying, why are you doing this? All the time. I get car brain on my feed all the time. And I think that's, you know, it, it's, it's something that you hear because, you know, I think again, Amer a lot of Americans or car centric folk can't understand how the bike could be you know, just as effective and efficient as a car. And when they see things like paint as an infrastructure, what's interesting is they, they think it's like an attack on their, on their cars and their car infrastructure. But what I think is a really interesting and important way to frame it is that 
they hate the paint infrastructure as much as we do. And so it should actually be a combined effort because if they're in the the the, the bike lane because they are allowed to be in the bike lane. There's nothing stopping them from the bike lane. Then we go into traffic and we slow everything down, which drivers hate. So, you know, I think part of it is, you know, that they, you know, it's, it feels very polarizing where it really shouldn't be polarizing. And, you know, now obviously navigating the, the car brain, the questions like, you know, why do you even bike? Go get a car. And it's like, well, no, that's not that's not the point. I'm not trying to say I'm anti-car because there, you know, as any of the urbanists or any of these um um, not, you know, organizations will tell you we need cars in some capacity. We just don't need the level of individualized car ownership and car usage that we have. So it's not about like us versus them. It's like, let's try and figure out a way where we can actually be our most efficient selves on both sides. Right. And so I, you know, I do deal with that. You know, I'm also very like, I, you know, my way of responding to them is just take what I want them to have said and then like respond to that. So I have comments where people are like, you know, we should never have, you know, bikes in the, in the, in the street. And I'll be like, you're so right. We really need separated space. Like a, I'm so glad you brought that up. And like the car brains, like, can't they hate that. But if you just keep responding in the way that you like want them to have said something, I think it's a very interesting way to not only drive engagement because, you know, the algorithm loves when people comment. So I'm just like, great. I'm just going to sort of, you know, throw some you know, kerosene on that fire and let them keep responding. And they're never going to get the response from me that they want, which is, you know, you know, you know, trying to engage in a fight. I'm always going to try and angle this is like, you're so right. We need to work together. We shouldn't be sharing spaces. What have you done lately to help make sure that, you know, we can do that, you know, stuff like that is about turning it on their, you know, turning it around, which is fun. And then of course I have a lot of cyclist followers who then attack the car brains, which is always very entertaining to see. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so we're actually looking at a, a very important uh, post that you have here, which is really looking at, you know, the pragmatic uh, realities of having to store cargo bikes. You have a very interesting uh, strategy that you employ. Uh, walk us through how you make sure that you uh, don't lose your precious cargo bikes. Well, I can't say for sure I'll never lose one, but um, I do have a PhD in criminal justice. And so I took a very evidence-based approach about how to keep my bike safe. Uh, and so, you know, one thing that people really like to talk about is something called routine activities theory, which is the idea that bike theft, which is typically a crime of opportunity, occurs when you have a motivated, a motivated offender, a suitable target, and lack of capable guardianship. And basically, the suitable target is obviously the bike. And so when it's exposed, when it has insufficient locks, when it is out all the time or uh, left unattended, that can be making it uh, a suitable target. And so I, I try to combat that by having really good locks, of course, and my secret weapon really is the motorcycle cover. Uh, and what's interesting about that is it hides it in plain sight. And so in New York City, you will see covered things like this all the time. And so I was like, well, I'll just hide my bikes under these co covers and no one really will mess with them because they're so ubiquitous that they become contextually assimilated. So I understanding that. So I always keep it covered whenever I'm you know, at home because I don't want people to find where they're stored. And I think that's really important. And when I'm out, um, I always keep it really well lit. I put them where there's lots of foot traffic just to, as best as I can. Of course, they're insured. Of course, I have GPS tracker on all of them. But, um, you know, I do take a very, you know, criminal justice PhD approach to, to trying to minimize this. And my husband's bike actually did get stolen. And um, he's like, well, I didn't follow any of your advice. And I said, no, you didn't. So, you know, I'm not surprised. I mean, I'm sorry that your bike got stolen, but I'm not surprised it got stolen because there were certainly things that I would not have advised that you do. And, you know, we actually have uh, footage of the theft uh, and, on one of the reels, which we can visit at another time. <laughs> Well, I, I do want to give some love here to Oni um, because, uh, you know, this is another thing that cities can start to look at is upping their game in terms of providing better bike infrastructure because there is better bike infrastructure out there that is possible. And so Oni and the Oni pod is, is an example of, uh, you know, 
being able for cities, and I believe that they just signed a contract with uh, Minneapolis where they're going to be, you know, installing a whole bunch of uh, very creative installations for activating the street space as well as providing secure parking opportunities uh, out on our streets. And so this is just one of you know several companies that I know of globally that are doing some really, really cool uh, creative stuff uh, that kind of helps. And it kind of gets to you, some of your points that you were just talking about is it it helps, you know, deal with the the crime of opportunity. You're putting some friction in place uh, and in putting the bikes, you know, undercover. So they're not obviously just sitting there waiting for somebody to come along and, and uh, take advantage of them. Absolutely. And that's a very big point of friction, again, for people to even buy a bike from the beginning, is they're very concerned about their bikes getting stolen. And so in New York, it's very common to have some of the smaller bikes or the long tail bikes. Um, but, you know, that isn't always the best bike for people, right, is they might need the front loader. So part of this is, of course, you know, giving strategies of how you can best store a front loading bike outside. But also like the Unipods, you're right. It's just they and I've seen, you know, because I'm very good friends with one of them, I have seen some of their designs of the the amazing way that they can incorporate both bike parking and public space. And so, you know, having safe biking infrastructure and safe biking parking only encourages people to say, I'm going to go visit this space, right? And they have like cargo bike lockers, which I think is really interesting, and corrals that can handle the size of cargo bikes, which is then, of course, encouraging families to show up to these places where they might not, or, you know, have previously thought to, sign, to go to. And so Uni, um, the Uni's been doing some designs where they're coupling the seating, the outdoor seating and uh, plaza style recreation being then encased on the sides with the with the cargo bike parking. And it's really interesting and really a no-brainer, especially in places like New York City, right, where we, we should just be encouraging people to bike all the time and also encouraging people to come and spend disposable income, right, at some of these stores, right? And so how do we do that? We, we have to make it as low friction as possible and get people on these bikes and be able to put them somewhere safely. Yeah. And, uh, and specifically like a lot of these bikes, uh, are, are quite expensive, but they also have the need for charging. And so that's another advantage that the, the Oni uh, system has is they are in, starting to integrate, um, uh, you know, e-bike charging, uh, facilities as part of those too. So kind of, yes, a, another... absolutely. And that's definitely can be a concern, you know, of course, some bikes like the recent Mueller, they have built in like double batteries, which, you know, is less, but, you know, most time people have one battery. And so, you know, they might not necessarily want to go somewhere, um, you know, because they're afraid of taking the long trip. But if Uni's going to be sort of providing some battery charging, I think that's amazing. Yeah. So this is um, one of our few pedestrianized places in, in New York City. And I actually had a follower who has not who's not been to New York and, you know, was very interested, request that I make this video of what it was like going down these uh, pedestrianized areas down Broadway. And it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So I'm always curious. I mean, I'm a health promotion professional. I've been in the in the game for going on 35 years now. Uh, and uh, about a decade ago, I started storytelling and started, you know, the YouTube channel uh, about five years ago, four years ago. Um, and so I had to kind of teach myself a whole new game, content creation and, and, and doing, you know, podcast interviews and all this kind of stuff. What's that been like for you, kind of learning new skills of, of filming and pho photography and, and, you know, shifting gears, pardon the pun, <laughs> to becoming a, 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 an advocate and, uh, you know, bicycle ad, um, influencer? You know, that's a really good question. I am not super high tech, so it's been a real challenge in some ways, but having like great equipment makes it very, very easy. And, um, you know, like this is shot with an Insta360 and on the invisible selfie stick. So people ask me all the time, do you have a drone? And I'm like, no, I just literally have like this pole that like goes up and then I'm just holding it because it's really narrow so I can just kind of hold it. Um, and then learning how to edit because I do all of this myself in between, you know, screaming kids and like my subway ride to work or, you know, I don't really, you know, it's not a full-time job. This is like a 20% project for me. And so it's definitely about how to create content and learn, you know, the cameras. And so one thing I do is I invest in good cameras, right? I have the iPhone 14 Pro. I'll have the Insta360 and the selfie stick to try and make it really, really easy to, to create 
good content really quickly because I think there's, you know, the, a lot of the content that comes out on Instagram is very ephemeral. And so I don't think it's important. I think it's very important to time box how much time I'm spending on creating these things and then just like keep pushing stuff out. And so more, and, and again, I think my followers are particularly keen on the messaging more so than the, you know, how, right. uh, how, yeah. how perfectly you, something's out. You don't have to be a documentary film producer. That's exactly yes. right. Yeah, a cinematographer. That's exactly yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. What haven't we covered that you think the audience here uh, at the Active Towns YouTube channel and and podcast uh, really needs to hear about your efforts and and what you're trying to achieve? Oh, that's a good one. What do they need to know? I think that we can have everyday heroes fighting for change. And, you know, it's about just getting us out, you know, getting everybody out there to just try things and try things that are interesting. Like, you know, if any of your followers are cargo bike curious, I do get the question a lot. Well, how do I get started? And I want to answer that by saying you are not alone and say the best way to get started is to one, find a friend, you know, I'm guaranteed that if you are cargo bike curious, it means that you've seen somebody in your neighborhood who's on a cargo bike. Go talk to them, right? So number one is just ask questions. Go learn about what they do, how much, you know, how much they have learned best practices in terms of cargo biking. And that's that's step number one. Step number two is trying out different bikes, right? See which one feels right, which again, I've been very specific on not working specifically with one brand because I want to be able to provide comparisons, which you'll see. I have a bunch of comparisons of two wheels versus trike, a uh, long tail, which is where the kids sit in back versus the, the front loaders and try and really give honest and unbiased opinions about what, you know, what you can expect when riding these different types of bikes. And so anyone who's kind of bike curious, who wants to learn really needs to get on the bikes to see what it feels like. And then, you know, ask questions. Uh, you know, find Facebook people, Instagram people to look for for inspiration of how to navigate things like biking in the rain, biking in the snow. Uh, this has been done for a long time. And I think that you don't have to reinvent the wheel and try and figure it out all on your own. And so that's something that I think is really important is for anybody who's thinking about it. Contact me. You're more than welcome to reach out to me. Contact a friend and, you know, begin asking those questions to how best get you on that journey. Yeah. And you do have a newsletter. Do you call it a newsletter? It's a newsletter. Yes, I, I do have a newsletter. So it's just CargoBikeMama.com. And I send out anything that, you know, again, this is a, a 20% project. So I don't have a, a set dedicated topic, but it's anything that I think, you know, my followers would like to know about or learn about or a particularly interesting post that I've done. So most recently, I did uh, a post on the comparisons between the trike and the uh, front loader. And so I'm probably going to be putting that in the newsletter. I also get lots of promo codes and I work with great brands. So I like to send those out because people are always looking for uh, bike gear recommendations. And so I'll send those out. And then, um, you know, there's a whole health and wellness component to cargo biking, you know, just the idea of the mental health support and the physical health that you get when you are biking versus sitting sedentary in a car. You know, and this is something that people are very, they push back a lot about. They're like, oh, but you know, you're, you're cheating on an e-bike. And first of all, I'm like, I saw one of my, one of the people I follow and they're like, well, if you think I'm cheating on the e-bike, let me <laughs> tell you about the car. Right. <laughs> and so, you know, she, Shannon, Shannon said that on, on Instagram. It was really great. And, you know, and so I like to talk about, you know, health and wellness components. I think I, uh, you know, and I like to just talk about, you know, kind of rest, even recipe, something very similar. Cause I'm a full-time working mom, right. I don't have a ton of time to do a lot of food, but I'm very like, conscientious about what I feed and what I feed my kids. And so it really, I think cargo biking isn't just, it's, it's, it really is about a lifestyle. And so the newsletter is about the lifestyle. So sign up for my newsletter, follow me on Instagram, reach out if you've got questions, you know, I'm very approachable and I really love helping people on this, you know, this, this path of discovery. Yeah. So I have a question for you. So I am not a parent. You are a parent. You've, you've got three. I have three, three, three. three. What do they prefer, the front or the back? Oh, uh, uh, that's a good question. Most of the time they prefer the front. They really enjoy um, front-loading cargo bikes. Why? Because when the weather gets 
inclement. They always are underneath a cover. So they're never outside in the elements. Then they also, they'll sit in this like inside, you know, you have two in the, in this, in the back and then like one in the front, they're just like chatting and hanging out. So they really love, you know, my kids really love being on the inside, uh, in the front, which I think is really, um, which is really funny. And like, which is what this clip is right here, inclement weather. And then boom, you've got the cover there. Exactly. And in the winter, I think the cover makes a lot of difference, right? Because, you know, all my kids just complain, right? When the moment, you know, moment there's something to complain about, my kids love to complain. Sure. So, in you know, you're cutting down the wind, you're cutting down the, um, you know, the snow, that kind of stuff, which makes it much better. And, you know, I think, you know, you mentioned that you're not a parent, but a cargo biking isn't just for parents, right? It's a really great car alternative to carrying groceries, to carrying furniture, gardening, like whatever it is that you might like want to be caring, I think is a very, it's, I think it's also very important that, you know, cargo bikes aren't just for, aren't, aren't just for families. They're also for normal everyday people who just want to carry furniture, for example. Yeah. A piano. <laughs> yes. A piano, yes. a dresser. Yes. I mean, I have my mom getting carried around donations, you know, bookshelves. Like we just carry everything in these, in these bikes and they're, you know, they're tanks. So, you know, they're not just limited to families. Yeah. Yeah. In fact, that, that's exactly uh, what I have is I have a turn GSD. And the reason I, I went with that one is uh, a it was available. It was uh, it, it was at my local bike shop here. And uh, and I I try to lean towards brands that I know are um, using good equipment. I, uh, you know, I'm a huge fan of the Bosch um, uh, uh, system, e-bike e system. And I've had, I've actually featured um, the North American uh, uh, Jocelyn Vandevelde from, from Bosch here on the channel. And so um, I decided to get the, 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 uh, the turn GSD and uh, same thing. Yeah. It, it's, fantastic for carrying the groceries, especially, you know, getting up a very, very steep hill up to our neighborhood here. Uh, yes, I could use just a normal analog bike, but you know, it's, it, it, it's, again, it's a car replacement. It, it gives me, uh, you know, we share one car, you know, Laura and I share one car and we hardly ever use it which is great because the darn thing is ancient and came with us from Hawaii. And so, <laughs> you know, we're able to nurse it along because we don't have to use it very frequently. And so, absolutely. Yeah. I think that's so we're not really car haters, you know, we just, you know, in fact, we, we, we love our little, our little Honda element. We, we, and we want to keep it around. We don't want to have to replace it. <laughs> so. Absolutely, And I think that's very, I think vast majority of Americans can go into a car of light style lifestyle doesn't have to be car free and i think that's a very important point is that people are like oh well if i go cargo bike i don't I, you know I, why would i do that i have my car and it's like well you know research shows that actually most of our trips are between one to three miles right so which in many cases can be done better and more efficiently and more cost effectively on a bike than on a car but there are going to be times when you need your little honda right and so like it makes sense to keep it and supplement your life with these bikes and you know i love that you brought up bosch i work very closely with bosch uh, because i really also believe in their products and the quality of their motors and their batteries and that's something that i think is an important uh decision component is when you think about what you're bringing into your home and what you're charging you know, Bosch really, you know, sets one of the gold standards in terms of keeping things up to the UL standard. And, you know, I think that's a very important and in, in the reliability of those of those bikes. Uh, I completely agree with and, you know, two or three of my bikes have Bosch systems and I <laughs> agree. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, this has been so much fun, <laughs> Maddie. Thank you. Me too. I really yeah. enjoyed this. Now, here's, here's a question for you before we sign off is, uh, so Instagram is your main platform on social media, correct? Correct. And then we've got the newsletter and we just had that up. So people, you can, you can go um, over here to the, to the website and, and sign up for the newsletter. Boom. Here it is again. Again, that's cargobikemama.com. And uh, I'm already subscribed. So I am getting your, your newsletter and I love it because you, you've got some really neat little stories along the way. And then you do have your promos there for some of the products that you uh, are, 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 you know, what is that? What do you, what do you call that? Do you wrap it? You know, whatever <laughs> affiliated with, there you go. <laughs> so that's great. Um, any, any interest in coming over to YouTube? Um, yes, 
I get that question a lot. Well, um, let me know if you do decide to come join us here at the YouTube family. I'd be happy to you know provide guidance and you know uh, from what little bit I have learned in the last uh, four years of diving into this. So I'm I'm a newbie, but yeah. Yeah. So, yes, I, you know, I was on Shifter's channel a little bit, oh, a little while ago, Tom Babin out of Canada. Um, and I get, after I started doing that club, people have asked me, they're like, you should do YouTube. You would be great. And I love it. I will get there. Um, I have very, you know, limited time, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, you're very, very busy. So, yeah, I, it, it, I would say continue doing what you're doing. You, if you get to a point where you can get some additional help so that you're not, because you're a single operator, I'm a single operator, and for me, it's full full time. So I'm I'm doing this seven days a week, and um, yeah, you you know how busy you really are. But yeah, I could totally see that this would resonate well here within the YouTube family, and I have found uh, the family just to be you know incredibly welcoming. Um, everyone from uh, you know from. You know, our, our good friend uh, Clarence Eckerson with Street Films, uh, as well as, uh, do you know uh, Propel, Chris? Of course. They're very good friends of ours. I'm on a couple of Chris's videos, and um, I see him when I can when he comes to town. And yes, it's very close with, with Chris. Yeah. And so, uh, again, that's we're talking about Chris Nolte um, again with Propel Bikes, another past uh, guest here on the podcast as well. But he also has he and Tara have a, a wonderful YouTube channel and uh, they're doing some great stuff and they're sort of shifting gears and going into a new phase of that channel. Uh, but, yeah, it's just a really welcoming family, I find uh, here on YouTube. So we we. Be well, delighted great. to welcome you. <laughs> <laughs> I will give it so much thought. And you know what it is? It's definitely been on my radar because so much of what I do is so visual that it would make sense. Yeah. And more longstanding than, you know, again, the ephemeral nature of Instagram, which, you know, you put a lot of effort in and then it's it's there, but it's hard to find, right? So... Yeah. Yeah. Well, and and I have to say this, you know, for my long suffering uh, podcast listeners. Yes, I did start as an audio only podcast and I do appreciate you all uh, for tuning in each week. I know that you uh, are probably listening to this on your uh, your walk around the neighborhood or maybe a drive. I don't know. (laughs) But uh, I I really do appreciate you all tuning in as well and tolerating the fact that we're uh, we are talking about visuals on screen here. And uh, so uh, be sure to tune in to the the YouTube version of it, the video of it, uh, if you were kind of wondering what it was we were talking about. And again, Maddie, thank you so much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Hey, thank you all so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode with Maddie Novich. And if you did, please, hey, give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell. And be sure to follow uh, Maddie over on Instagram. That is Carpo Bike Mama. And if you're enjoying this content here on the Active Towns channel, please consider supporting my efforts by becoming an Active Towns ambassador. It's easy to do. Just head on over to activetowns.org and then navigate up to the support tab. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. I really do appreciate it. And until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.